Welcome to Science Views from the Valley. I'm your host, Dr. Kelly Kassan. Science Views from the Valley is a monthly program that will explore interesting science topics and how they relate to the San Luis Valley and the Upper Rio Grande region. I hope everyone had a lovely Easter. In honor of the Easter holiday, the topic today will be the animal group Lagomorpha, the hares, rabbits, and pika. Lagomorphs look somewhat like rodents and are closely related to the rodents. But lagomorphs have four incisors, the chewing teeth in front, in the upper jaw, while rodents only have two. Like rodents, the incisors grow throughout their lives. Lagomorphs are also strictly herbivorous, while many rodents are omnivorous, eating both meat and vegetable matter. Female lagomorphs are larger than the males, while in rodents, the males are larger than the females. The ancestor of lagomorphs is still debated, but most experts state that lagomorphs descended from a common ancestor that lived in Eastern Asia during the late Paleocene or early Eocene periods. The oldest known lagomorph dates to the late Eocene period in North America and Asia. This ancestor was already adapted for fast running and leaping. Currently, 80 species of lagomorphs are recognized, but despite the small number of species, lagomorphs are extremely successful, existing on every continent except Antarctica and most islands. Lagomorpha consists of three major groups, the rabbits and hares, which belong to the family Leporidae, and the pikas, which belong to the family Ocotonidae. The Leporidae are characterized by their long hind feet, strong jumping hind legs, and the shorter forelegs. The soles of the feet are heavily furred, which allows rabbits and hares to have a better grip on the substrate while running. The ears of rabbits and hares are also distinctive, being elongated and mobile. The ear structure allows the animal to have excellent hearing, which help them to sense nearby predators. All rabbits and hares are strictly herbivorous, eating primarily grasses and other herbaceous plants. They are also coprophagous, which means that the animal passes food through their digestive system once, producing a soft green feces that is then eaten. The second pass through the digestive system produces a dry, dark pellet that is abandoned by the rabbits. The Leporidae are separated into rabbits and true hares. Several differences are seen between rabbits and hares. Hares are typically larger than rabbits and have longer ears and legs. Hares are able to run long distances while rabbits run in short bursts. The hare's ability to run long distances is due to the longer muscle fibers seen in their muscle tissue. Rabbits tend to have shorter muscle fibers. Baby hares, called leverets, are precocial. They are born fully furred and with their eyes open. Rabbits, however, have altricial young. They are slightly furred and their eyes are closed at birth. Though both hares and rabbits are herbivorous, Hares prefer plant shoots, twigs, and bark. Rabbits prefer leafy vegetables and grasses. Hares, unlike rabbits, are typically solitary, building homes in hollow logs or in nests they build by stomping down prairie grasses into shallow depressions. Rabbits are usually colonial, living with dozens of other rabbits in underground warrens. Even at the chromosome level, hares are different. They have 48 chromosomes, while rabbits have 44. The true hares include the snowshoe hare, the arctic hare, and the jackrabbits. Snowshoe and arctic hares live in very cold climates, boreal forests, montane forests, and tundra. So they change color with the seasons. Their summer coat is brown, which allows them to be camouflaged against the brown soil and grasses, while their winter coat is white, which hides them amongst the snows in the winter. Arctic hares that live in tundra, or far north habitats that stay frozen all year, are known to remain white even in the summer months. The 
Colorado is home to three species of hares, the snowshoe hare, the black-tailed jackrabbit, and the white-tailed jackrabbit. The snowshoe hare lives primarily in montane forests, preferably those dense with shrubs. Like many prey animals, the snowshoe hare is primarily crepuscular, which means that they are active in the twilight hours, and they are also known to be nocturnal. During the day, they remain hidden from predators by staying in their grassy depressions. Snowshoe hares are active year-round. They do not undergo a hibernation or torpor like many rodents do. Their breeding season can begin as early as late December and will last until late summer. They are polygynandrous, meaning that both males and females will mate with multiple partners. Both males and females will do mid-air urinations to attract mates, and the males will persistently chase the females. If you hike the mountains while the snow is still on the ground, you may see the signs of snowshoe rabbit mating behavior. You will find multiple urination spots and erratic trails. Both males and females will undergo boxing matches during the mating season. These hare antics is the origin of the phrase, mad as a March hare, which first appeared in writing in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales in the late 14th century. The March hare character in Lewis Carroll's book, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, was also based on these mating behaviors. Once pregnant, females become highly aggressive and intolerant of males. Females are known to have up to four litters per year if they have access to plentiful food. The gestation period is approximately 35 to 40 days. The average litter size of a snowshoe hare is approximately three, but the juvenile mortality is quite high. Over 50% of the young will die within 30 days. The main cause of this mortality is predation by red and ground squirrels. The white-tailed jackrabbit is the largest hare species, reaching 22 to 26 inches in length and weighing between 5 and 10 pounds. You can find white-tailed jackrabbits in the plains and alpine meadows in Colorado. Like the snowshoe hare, the white-tailed jackrabbit is nocturnal, hiding in shallow depressions in the grasses during the day. Males will fight each other during mating seasons with charging, leaping, and jostling matches, often with several males. The females observe these matches and will choose a mate based on their observations. The gestation is slightly longer than that of the snowshoe hare, 42 days on average. The litter sizes are considerably larger, four to five is the average litter size, though 11 have been seen. These large litter sizes may be due to the heavy predation pressure on white-tailed jackrabbits. Foxes, badgers, bobcats, mountain lions, and wolves are all known to prey on adult jackrabbits. Eagles, hawks, and owls are also known to prey on jackrabbits, particularly the juveniles. The golden eagle is the only raptor that is large enough to successfully attack a full-grown adult hare. The young white-tailed jackrabbits will begin to forage on their own by two weeks of age and are fully weaned at one month. Though the white-tailed jackrabbit in Colorado is not endangered, populations in Wyoming has been declining for unknown reasons. The last species of jackrabbit in Colorado is the black-tailed jackrabbit. They prefer habitats that are dense with shrubs and conifers. They particularly like areas that are dominated by sagebrush or black greasewood. They require a diet with a mix of different herbaceous plants. They also require water-rich vegetation to maintain their daily water intake and will switch from above-ground vegetation to deep-rooted shrubs when above-ground vegetation is scarce. Their favorite plant is alfalfa, which is very water-rich and has deep roots. Their mating behavior is similar to that of the white-tailed jackrabbit, but their young is more independent. Young black-tailed jackrabbits will only nurse their mothers for three to four days and are completely independent when they reach one month old. 
The black-tailed jackrabbit is also able to swim, dog paddling with all four feet. The black-tailed jackrabbit, however, is a host animal to many different ectoparasites, including fleas, ticks, lice, and mice. They are also prone to endoparasites, including the flukes, tapeworms, and roundworms. This makes the black-tailed jackrabbit susceptible to vector-borne diseases like tularemia, otherwise known as rabbit fever, equine encephalitis, brucellosis, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Rabbits infected with tularemia will die very quickly after contracting the disease. All of these diseases are zoonotic, meaning that they can be spread to humans. Thus, it is best to avoid touching any wild hare that appears sick in the wild. Colorado is also home to three species of rabbits, the mountain cottontail, the desert cottontail, and the eastern cottontail. All cottontail species are opportunistic generalists, eating not only wild vegetation, but garden vegetables and leafy plants used in landscaping. The mountain cottontail looks similar to the snowshoe hare, except it is much smaller. They primarily live in western states. Though they prefer to eat grasses, they are also known to eat sagebrush, rabbit brush, and salt brushes. Mountain cottontails are also known to climb juniper bushes to feed. They prefer habitats that are brushy on slopes and river banks. Unlike most rabbit species, the mountain cottontail is not a social species, though they are known to feed in congregations at dusk. Because they live in habitats that may lack adequate moisture and or vegetation, mountain cottontails conserve energy. Even during mating season, a mountain cottontail will use less than 10% of their total energy in mating behaviors. They use the freeze method of hiding from predators, unlike the hares which use their long legs and speed to escape predators. They typically mate in the spring and summer. The female will build a shallow depression and line it with fur from her own body. The gestation period of the mountain cottontail is quite short, 28 to 30 days. The litter size averages four to five babies. The babies, like all rabbits, are altricial. They are born with their eyes closed and are bald. They reach adulthood when they are approximately three months old. The lifespan of the mountain cottontail due to the heavy predation, averages approximately 15 months. The desert cottontail lives in primarily plains and western states. Though it is called the desert cottontail, this species is known to live in a large variety of habitats, including desert grasslands, riparian areas, and pinyon juniper forests. Their range often overlaps that of the black-tailed jackrabbit. The desert cottontail is lighter colored than the mountain cottontail and has a whitish underside of the body. They also have a orange-brown throat patch. They are known to be active at any time of the day, though they are most often seen in early morning, late afternoon, and evening. Because the desert cottontail lives in very dry habitats, they conserve moisture by avoiding activity in the hottest times of the day. They obtain most of their moisture from eating water-rich plants and the dew that forms on these plants. Like the mountain cottontail, desert cottontails have the ability to climb trees in order to feed on the leaves or to escape predators. They are also known to be able to swim like the black-tailed jackrabbit. Desert cottontails are more colonial than the mountain cottontail and will signal to other cottontails that predators are nearby by raising its tail, flashing the white underside. Coyotes are the most common predator of the desert cottontails, but other predators include the weasel, hawks, owls, eagles, badgers, and foxes. Desert cottontails, like the mountain cottontail, will use the freeze method of hiding from predators, but some are known to fight back against smaller predators like the weasel and badgers, by kicking their strong hind legs. Eastern cottontails are more widespread than the mountain and desert cottontails, living in all of the eastern states and some regions of the southwestern states 
including eastern and southern Colorado. Though the eastern cottontail is not native to the Pacific states, it has been introduced there and stable populations exist in Oregon and Washington. Like the other cottontails seen in North America, they prefer to forage in open areas with lots of herbaceous and shrubby plants. Eastern cottontails do not build burrows or dens, but they will use burrows dug by woodchucks, groundhogs, and other burrowing animals. They require a lot of woody cover to survive predation. They are crepuscular to nocturnal feeders, spending most of the day in shallow depressions under woody cover or in burrows. When chased, eastern cottontails will run in a zigzag pattern, reaching speeds of 18 miles per hour. Eastern cottontails reach maturity quickly, often producing litters as early as two months of age. Females can have up to seven litters per year, with an average of five babies, called kits, per litter. This high reproductive rate helps to counteract the heavy predation of the species. 43% of young eastern cottontails will be killed by predators each year. Another common cause of mortality is automobiles, especially in the spring months of March through May. Eastern cottontails love the roadside vegetation and will often feed by the roadsides at night, making them vulnerable to automobile accidents. Pikas, however, look very different from rabbits or hares. They have short, rounded ears and a more rounded body. They have shorter legs and no external tail. Pika typically live in rocky slopes in the alpine habitats and like rabbits and hares, they have a strictly herbivorous diet. Two pika species live in North America, the American pika, which is found here in Colorado, and the collared pika, which primarily lives in Western Canada and Alaska. Unlike rabbit and hares, the American pika are monogamous, forming mate pairs with adults in adjacent territories. Each female pika will have up to two litters per year with an average of three young per litter. The pika young are blind, slightly haired, and have fully erupted teeth at birth. Female pika will spend most of their time foraging, only returning to their young every two hours to nurse them. Young pika become independent by four weeks and grow quickly, reaching adult size by three months. This fast growth rate allows them to reach an ideal weight to better survive the harsh winters in their habitat. The annual mortality among pika is high. 37 to 53 percent of pika will die each year. Most die when very young or when very old. The average lifespan of a pika in the wild is three years. However, some, especially in captivity, can live to seven years. Pika are mostly asocial and territorial. Females will disperse farther from their natal area than the males, but both will set up territories and defend them by chasing and fighting other pika. But though they are asocial, they do communicate with other pika in other territories. Pika will produce either a short call or a long call. The short call is an alarm call and consists of repeated short calls that change in frequency depending on the size of the predator seen. Long calls are used almost exclusively by males during the breeding season, though mated pairs are known to sing duets. Pika are also known to use secretions to scent mark their hay piles and territories. Cheek markings, for example, are used to mark territorial borders and to attract potential mates. Urine and feces are usually placed on the hay piles to mark ownership. The hay piles are used for feeding during the long winter months. Pika are able to assess plants for their nutritional value, preferring plants with high protein, fats, and water over plants that are less caloric. By assessing plants and making hay piles of the preferred plants, 
pika are able to store enough calories to survive the winter. Uneaten hay piles decompose and fertilize the soil, allowing for better plant growth in the spring. Thus, pika provide a much needed nutrient boost to alpine habitats. Pika typically do not drink water. Most of their moisture is gained through the consumption of plants. Like the rabbit and hares, pika are also coprophagous. Despite being a prey animal, Pika are diurnal, meaning that they are active during the day. The most dangerous predators to pika are the weasels and the ermine, but larger predators like coyotes and martens are also known to prey on pika. Rabbits are eaten, and the main component of well-known dishes like the German stew Hassenpfeffer. But due to the very low fat content of rabbit meat, Rabbits are a poor choice for survival diets. Rabbit starvation, malnutrition that occurs in diets that are primarily rabbit and other very lean meats, is caused by this lack of fat content. People who consume primarily rabbit will not take in enough calories to replace those that are burned through daily activities. Modern humans are only capable of deriving 20% of their energy needs from protein, making the consumption of fats necessary to maintain good health. Chris McCandless, the young man who starved to death in the Alaskan wilderness in 1992, is thought to have died from rabbit starvation. Despite a high reproductive rate, the rise of feral cats and other predators have greatly impacted several Lagomar species. The San Jose brush rabbit, whose range is in Mexico, and the riverine rabbit in Africa are critically endangered today. So how did the rabbit become a symbol of Easter? The Easter bunny was originally the Easter hare and originated in German Lutheran folklore. The first records of this legend appear in approximately 1682. According to legend, the Easter hare evaluated whether children were naughty or nice at the start of the season of Eastertide, also known as the Paschal season. The Easter hare, according to legend, carried colored eggs in a basket, candy, and occasionally toys to the homes of good children. So why an Easter hare instead of another creature? Greek and Roman authors believe that the hare was hermaphroditic, thus were capable of a virgin birth. This mistaken belief led to an association with the Virgin Mary, and illuminated manuscripts and northern European paintings of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus began to include images of hares. But why did the Easter hare carry eggs when hares most certainly do not lay eggs? Early Christianity viewed eggs as a symbol of rebirth, making it an appropriate Easter symbol. Medieval European children often went door to door begging for eggs on the Saturday before Lent, during which egg eating was prohibited. The origin of the tradition of dying Easter eggs is not known, but German Protestants retained the tradition of coloring and eating eggs on Easter. Eggs were boiled with flowers, which colored the eggs. Eastern Orthodox churches continue to dye eggs red for Easter to symbolize the blood of the sacrificed Christ and the spring renewal. The tradition of an egg-giving hare came to the U.S. in the 18th century with the migration of the German Protestants in Pennsylvania and the surrounding areas. Rabbits appear in many different cultural mythology. Among the southeastern Native Americans, the rabbit was the trickster. Mexican and Central American tribes saw the rabbits as symbols of fertility. The Hopi and the Shawnee used rabbits as clan animals, and the Kiowa had a rabbit society. In astronomy news for the San Luis Valley, the Lyric meteor shower begins tonight and will last through tomorrow night. This year's shower is predicted to have approximately 20 meteors per hour at its peak. This shower is caused by the dust particles left behind 
by the comet C 1861 G1, which was first discovered in 1861 by A. E. Thatcher and Carl Wilhelm Bacher. This comet is an extremely long period comet with a 415 year orbit. The comet is expected to return long after I am dead in 2283. You will be able to see the Eta Aquarian meteor shower on May 6th and 7th. This shower is also an average shower in the northern hemisphere with predictions of 30 meteors per hour at its peak. This meteor shower was produced by arguably the most famous comet, Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet was discovered before 467 BC and it has an orbit of approximately 75 to 76 years. Samuel Clemens, better known under his pen name Mark Twain, was born in 1835 when Halley's Comet was visible in the U.S. He predicted that since he came in with Halley's Comet, he would also go out with it. This prediction came true. He died one day after Halley's Comet made its closest approach to Earth in 1910. Thank you for listening in to today's show. Next month's show will be on May 27th, and the topic will be insecticides, just in time for the growing season. As always, you are welcome to email me any science topics you would like to hear about at spiderwomankrza at gmail.com. I would like to thank everyone here at KRZA for their help in developing this show. 